Sermon on the Last Judgment by St. John of Shanghai and San Francisco Given on Meat Fair Sunday, the Sunday of the Last Judgment, one week before the beginning of Great Lent. The day of the Last Judgment, that day no one knows, only God the Father knows, but its signs are given in the Gospel and in the Apocalypse of the Holy Apostle John the Theologian. Revelation speaks of the events at the end of the world and of the Last Judgment primarily in images and in a veiled manner. However, the Holy Fathers have explained these images, and there is an authentic church tradition that speaks clearly concerning the signs of the approach of the end and concerning the Last Judgment. Before the end of life on earth, there will be agitation, wars, civil war, hunger, earthquakes. Men will suffer from fear, will die from expectation of calamity. There will be no life, no joy of life, but a tormented state of falling away from life. Nevertheless, there will be a falling away not only from life, but from faith also. And when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Men will become proud, ungrateful, rejecting divine law. Together with the falling away from life will be a weakening of moral life. There will be an exhaustion of good and an increase of evil. Of these times, the Holy Apostle John the Theologian speaks in his God-inspired work, The Apocalypse. He says that he was in the Spirit when he wrote it. This means that the Holy Spirit himself was in him, when under the form of various images, the fate of the church and the world was open to him, and so this is a divine revelation. The apocalypse represents the fate of the church in the image of a woman who hides herself in the wilderness. She does not show herself in public life, as today in Russia. In public life, forces that prepare the possibility for the appearance of Antichrist will play the leading role. Antichrist will be a man and not the devil incarnate. Anti means old, and it signifies in place of or against. Antichrist is a man who desires to be in place of Christ, to occupy his place and possess what Christ should possess. He desires to possess the attraction of Christ and authority over the whole world. Moreover, Antichrist will receive that authority before his destruction and the destruction of the world. What is known of this man, Antichrist? His precise ancestry is unknown, his father is completely unknown, and his mother a foul, pretended virgin. He will be a Jew of the tribe of Dan. He will be very intelligent and endowed with skill in handling people. He will be fascinating and kind. The philosopher Vladimir Soloviev worked a long time at presenting the advent and person of Antichrist. He carefully made use of all material on this question, not only patristic, but also Muslim, and he worked out a brilliant picture. Before the advent of Antichrist, there was a preparation in the world, the possibility of his appearance. The mystery of iniquity doth already work, 2 Thessalonians 2.7. The forces preparing for his appearance fight above all against the lawful imperial authority. The Holy Apostle Paul says that Antichrist cannot be manifested until what withholdest is taken away. St. John Chrysostom explains that the withholding one is the lawful pious authority. Such an authority fights with evil. For this reason, the mystery, already at work in the world, fights with this authority. It desires a lawless authority. When the mystery decisively achieves that authority, nothing will hinder the appearance of Antichrist any longer. Fascinating, intelligent, kind, he will be merciful. He will act with mercy and goodness, but not for the sake of mercy and goodness, but for the strengthening of his own authority. When he will have strengthened it to the point where the whole world acknowledges him, then he will reveal his face. For his capital, he will choose Jerusalem, because it was here that the Savior revealed his divine teaching and his person. 
It was here that the entire world was called to the blessedness of goodness and salvation. The world did not acknowledge Christ and crucified him in Jerusalem. Whereas the whole world will acknowledge the Antichrist's authority, and Jerusalem will become the capital of the world. Having attained the pinnacle of authority, Antichrist will demand the acknowledgement that he has attained what no earthly power had ever attained or could attain, and then demand the worship of himself as a higher being, as a god. Vladimir Soloviev describes the character of his activity well as supreme ruler. He will do what is pleasing to all, on the condition of being recognized as supreme authority. He will allow the church to exist, permit her divine services, promise to build magnificent churches, on the condition that all recognize him as supreme being and worship him. Antichrist will have a personal hatred for Christ. He will see him as a rival and look upon him as a personal enemy. He will live by his hatred and rejoice in men's apostasy from Christ. Under Antichrist, there will be an immense falling away from the faith. Many bishops will change in faith and in justification will point to the brilliant situation of the church. The search for compromise will be the characteristic disposition of men. Straightforwardness of confession will disappear. Men will cleverly justify their fall, and gracious evil will support such a general disposition. There will be the habit of apostasy from truth and the sweetness of compromise and sin in men. Antichrist will allow men everything as long as they fall down and worship him and the whole world will submit to him. Then there will appear the two righteous men, who will fearlessly preach the faith and accuse Antichrist. According to church tradition, they are the two prophets of the Old Testament, Elijah and Enoch, who did not taste of death, but will taste it now for three days, and in three days they must rise. Their death will call forth the great rejoicing of Antichrist and his servants. Their resurrection will plunge them into great confusion and terror. Then, the end of the world will come. The Apostle Peter said that the first world was made out of water, an image of the primordial chaos, and perished by water in the flood. Now the world is reserved unto fire. The earth and the works that are therein shall be burned up, all the elements will ignite. This present world will perish in a single instant. In an instant, all will be changed. Moreover, the sign of the Son of God, the sign of the cross, will appear. The whole world, having willingly submitted to Antichrist, will weep. Everything is finished forever. Antichrist killed. The end of his kingdom of warfare with Christ. The end and one is held accountable, one must answer to the true God. The end of the world signifies not the annihilation of the world, but its transformation. Everything will be transformed suddenly, in the twinkling of an eye. The dead will rise in new bodies, their own, but renewed, just as the Savior rose in his own body, and traces of his wounds from the nails and spear were on it. Yet it possessed new faculties, and in this sense it was a new body. It is not clear whether this new body will be the same as Adam was made, or whether it will be an entirely new body. Afterward, the Lord will appear in glory in the clouds. Trumpets will sound loud with power. They will sound in the soul and conscience. All will become clear to the human conscience. The prophet Daniel speaking of the last judgment, relates how the Ancient of Days, the judge sits on his throne, and before him is a fiery storm. Fire is a purifying element. It burns sin. Woe to a man if sin has become a part of his nature. Then the fire will burn the man himself. This fire will be kindled within man. Seeing the cross, some will rejoice but others will fall into confusion, terror, and despair. Thus, men will be divided instantly. 
The very state of a man's soul casts him to one side or the other, to right or to left. The more consciously and persistently man strives toward God in his life, the greater will be his joy when he hears, Come unto me, ye blessed. Conversely, the same words will call the fire of horror and torture to those who did not desire him, who fled and fought or blasphemed him during their lifetime. The last judgment knows of no witnesses or written protocols. Everything is inscribed in the souls of men, and these records, these books, are opened at the judgment. Everything becomes clear to all and to oneself. Moreover, some will go to joy, while others to horror. When the books are opened, it will become clear that the roots of all vices lie in the human soul. Here is a drunkard or a lecher. When the body has died, some may think that sin is dead too. No. There was an inclination to sin in the soul, and that sin was sweet to the soul. And if the soul is not repented and has not freed itself of the sin, it will come to the last judgment with the same desire for sin. It will never satisfy that desire, and in that soul there will be the suffering of hatred. It will accuse everyone and everything in its tortured condition. It will hate everyone and everything. There will be gnashing of teeth, of powerless malice, and the unquenchable fire of hatred. A fiery Gehenna, such is the inner fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth, such is the state of hell. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, of St. John of Shanghai and San Francisco, O Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us. Amen.